See, by necessity, then, God's got to save these people in their sins, then clean them up later by magically altering their desires to sin less and obey more. And we hear this all the time, I'm a work in progress. Consequently, then, the entire system of Christian theology is founded on this backward premise. Everything, boom, 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 right underneath it, as we've shown. Within the framework of this, they teach varying degrees of the saved sinner being that work in progress. Some of people call it a gradual sanctification, a kind of a growth process. There's growth for you, but they don't, they don't understand that. Under which the sinner participates not in a purging, but in a focus group environment that's applicable to his addiction, and then he learns to manage his lusts. And I've seen talk to people that have come out of this mess by God's grace and got that purging and they say, what, what a mess that is. They've told me, what a mess that is, because you just constantly keep falling back in to that same addiction. It's, it's never cleaned up. It's like alcoholism. They, they tell them, well, you're always going to be an alcoholic. No, you're going to be a saint if you're going to come to God through repentance and be changed into regeneration. All things become new. All things. What, about, what part of all don't you understand? See, the absolute worst part of this farce is that this pagan myth, and that's what it is, this dual nature of man, inbred nature, is entirely permeated not only religion, but all schools of thought in the human, human mind. Science claims genetic malfunction as the cause of these harmful indulgences in man that leads to disease and ruination of their lives. Religion and academia, they follow suit with the ideas of uh, inherited nature or some kind of environmental influences. And regardless of the source of the addiction, it must be treated as a disease that man can learn through a multi-step program to manage but never really overcome it. Now we can have all the platitudes about how this and this might happen, but we see it never really, never really is regeneration taking place. So the soul's still lost, folks. Even if the guy comes out of his drug addiction and his alcoholism and he really does stop cold turkey, he's still his soul is lost. That's the sad part of this. So I've seen people do that, come out and ne never take another drink or another needle, another pill, but their, s their soul has to be redeemed. Not just their flesh. See, it's from this school of, school of thought that the gospel of Jesus is preached worldwide as this magic veil, cloak, covering, we've called it many times, to appease man in his inborn perfections. He's, nobody's perfect. We all sin. We keep told that time and time again. How about, how about we all obey? How about we all sin, go and sin no more? Depart from iniquity. How about standing in favor of those things? See, in reality, God is asking man to do his part in this process of this purging. So repentance proven by deeds is where you take your bath, so to speak, the washing yourself, making yourself clean, like the Isaiah chapter 1 passage. Then you forsake all your wrongdoings, put away the evil of your doings, Isaiah goes on to say in that chapter, Isaiah chapter 1 verses 16 through 18. Thus, then, you can learn, cease to do evil and learn to do good in your heart with a new heart and a new, new mind. Now you can reason together with God. See, all that has to happen before. Come, let us reason together. It goes on to say in that passage, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Many people quote that passage, but they leave out the purging again. Like I said, only forgiveness, see? Covering. No, it has to be the purging. Then we can reason with God from a mind free from the insanity of sin and guile and deceit and come and seek His mercy and find it. See, if a man can reason, God's asking us, begging us to reason, then he can make a choice between good and evil. And that's the frame of mind that the Bible is written in. Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near, and let the wicked forsake his way, and let the unrighteous man his thoughts, and return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and on our God, and for he will abundantly pardon. 
We quote that verse a thousand times on these blogs, and they don't get it. These church people, these people in the system, under the influence of this repeat-after-me nonsense, sin nature stuff. What don't you understand about that? You can forsake your evil ways, your guile, your ulterior motives we're talking about here. That, well, maybe, you know, I'm still going to do my filthy stuff on the internet and my horrible things with drinking and drugs. No, you first truly come clean with God, just like you would if you were seeking to gain your spouse back after you committed adultery. You wouldn't still be hanging on to that other person, still participating in that other relationship. You'd be flat on your face, begging with all your heart to be forgiven. Then... The mercy may be extended. They don't have to extend that mercy. It may be if they find you're totally sincere. Like David said in Psalm 32, in heart, in whose heart there is no guile. Guile, deceit. That's the key here. See, your preachers, they don't believe this. Your Bible school, your Sunday school teachers, your Bible study leaders, they don't believe any of this. Theologians, they're in massive darkness that write the books and put out the videos and all that stuff online everywhere. They're, they're in darkness. The Bible pundits, they just muddle this up by mixing truth and error together. So it's all confusing in people's minds. But deep down in your soul, as a functioning human being, you know that your addictions to this horrible life that you're in a result of the choices that you've made. You need help, you cry. Yeah, that's what you say. But what you really mean, see that guile still in your heart, what you really mean, you want appeasement. You want somebody to pat you on the head and say it's all okay, and that's love. See, that's the tolerance you want. That's not what God's doing here. You're not going to find God in that way. Only through this phony church system, you may find some comfort but you're not going to find life in Christ. See, dying out to a long practiced self-indulgence, it's not an easy task. I've never said it was. And it's not pleasant to face the reality that you have to reach down deep within yourself and admit that it's all you're doing, all your own doing, not your environment, not somebody else's fault. Nobody put a gun to your head so you drink or do drugs or do vile things. No, it's you. You did it. It all begins with your desire, your deep down, diligent, anything, do anything desire to break free of this self-inflicted bondage that you put yourself under and seek God with everything that's in you. Not repeat after me. Not go to some church and try to get a good feeling or of euphoria, a warmth because the people pretend that they love you. They don't love you if they're not bringing you out of your sins. Don't you see that? If they're just patting you on the head and saying, oh, we understand, we're all sinners, that's not Christ. That's not the gospel. See, this process we're talking about, it may indeed take a while. But God, He can be, be found by those that diligently seek Him. It's like Hebrews 11 says. Hebrews 11.8 you come to God, you believe that He is, He exists, and He rewards those that diligently seek Him. Rewards with what? So you can be washed and cleansed and purged and purified when you obey, simply obey what He said to do. Forsake your wicked ways. And what's that entail? How many times do we have to say it? How many times? All that guile and deceit in your heart to go and repeat those things again and again and again. That's what the purging is. Without purging, there'll never be purity of heart. And with no purity of heart, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. With no purity, there's going to be no, no Christ. There's going to be no gospel, no kingdom hereafter. You have religion on the cross the great divide, but you're not going to have Christ, not in reality. Those that think they do, they're under great darkness. They think it's light. I understand that. But they're under great and bitter darkness until they wake up to this. I pray that you do. Contact me on my website, standinthegap.org. 
all the PDFs and the files, you can go there and look at them as you will. And I thank those out there that are standing up for the truth and that are fighting and contending every day and putting all their efforts into it. And those of you that think you're saved, that think you've really come to repentance and not doing anything, wake up before you lose what you think you have. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, if we don't give up. That scripture's in Galatians chapter 6. Well, if you never started, you, know, you, you didn't have anything to give up. Don't fool yourself. You'd be on fire for God. A flame of fire for God. 